Welcome all and thank you for joining today's session. My name is Michael Downey and it's great to be back for another AWRI webinar. This is the first of six sessions AWRI have scheduled to run over the next couple of months and there's some really exciting content coming up, but none more so than today's, which takes a look at the impacts of dissolved carbon dioxide on taste, flavour and textural properties of red and white wines. Now, before we jump in and make a start, a couple of quick reminders for anyone new to AWRI webinars to provide a comment or to ask a question, uh, please open the Q&A section of the webinar, type in your question and click to send it through. Also a reminder, the webinar is being recorded and it will be available to view later this afternoon via the AWRI's YouTube channel. Um, all registrants will receive a link to view this recording later. Now, for those of you that have just joined, Welcome, today's webinar provides insights into how dissolved carbon dioxide can affect the taste texture of still white and red wine. And it's fantastic to have Dr. Richard Gore with us to shed some light on this topic. Richard is a research scientist at the AWRI and has an extensive and long history working in wine science with a strong focus on the compositional factors that affect in mouth texture. Prior to working for the AWRI, Richard trained and worked as a winemaker, was appointed the, the inaugural lecturer in sensory science at the University of Adelaide, and taught the principles of food and wine matching at the Le Cordon Bleu Culinary School. Richard, it's fantastic to have your expertise on hand, and if you're ready to make a start, I'll hand over to you. Hello and welcome to today's seminar. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your day or, or night, whatever the case may be, and, uh, and for being with us. Um, today I'll be sharing with you the results of our recent work on how dissolved carbon dioxide affects the taste of still wine, how uh, carb dissolved carbon dioxide interacts with the important aspects of the wine matrix to influence the taste, its taste and mouthfeel. I'll also go outside the winery might mindset and cover some preliminary work that we have just just done on answering the question, what happens to the level of dissolved carbon dioxide after the bottle is opened and the wine has been poured? That is, what might the, consu the consumer experience be? Firstly, I must apologise uh, for the blandness of the opening slide. We spent some time with our comms people in an attempt to spice it up a bit. And after some deliberation, we, we came up with this. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> hey, carbon dioxide is a colourless and at least in the classical sense an odourless gas produced during fermentation or introduced by gas exchange processes in the winery. Um, it's soluble up to around 2.8 grams a litre at typical white wine temperatures uh, when they're served and around one and a half at room temperature when we normally drink red wines. Um, it's also a very dull thing to talk about at parties something that I recently learnt. <clears throat> but the level of uh, dissolved carbon dioxide in still wine is important from a quality perspective. The bottling specifications of still, still white and red table wines typically include a target concentration. Um, if too low, the wine can taste flat and give the impression that it lacks freshness um, and life, or some people even call it zing. But the, if it's excessive, the wine can show an obvious spritz or fizzy character that doesn't match up with consumers' expectations of that particular wine style. But what is a still wine? Well, it's at last look. Um, in the US, it's defined as uh, wines containing less than 3.92 grams per litre. How they come up with 3.92 is, is anyone's guess. In Australia, it's five grams per litre, and in the EU, six grams per litre is used to legally differentiate sparkling wine um, uh, from still wine. Um, however, within these really broad legal uh, limits, winemakers routinely adjust dissolved carbon dioxide to a level that is consistent with a desired style. 
either by direct gas exchange with nitrogen known as sparging, or more recently using membrane contactors that work by gas exchange through a porous membrane. Uh, my colleague Simon Nordisgaard has presented a fabulous webinar um, as part of the AWRI series um, on these technologies, and it's well worth uh, uh, checking out if you're interested. Um, the range of dissolved carbon dioxide um, uh, applied by winemakers in commercial practice varies, but typically it's dialed up for lighter bodied styles of wine, such as Riesling and Sauvignon Blanc. But, at, but for uh, oak styles, for example, Chardonnay, it's usually a, a, a lower level is desired. As one, might, as one winemaker I spoke to put it, great Chardonnay feels creamy and silky. You don't want it, to, you don't want that to be fighting with CO2 spritz. Similarly for red wines, um, lighter bodied styles are generally given more dissolved carbon dioxide uh, than fuller bodied. Um, exactly how much is right is determined by individual winemakers. But for reds, normally 0.4 to 0.5 grams per litre for full bodied styles and up to one gram for lighter styles of reds is common. For whites, the uh, typical range is between 0.5 and two grams per litre. And, but certain styles such as Vino Verde can contain up to three. Now, look, um, at this junction, I'd like to ask a favour of, of you. I like you to close your eyes and spend 10 seconds or so imagining the sensation of having a carbonated water in your mouth or just carbonated anything. If you happen to accidentally have a glass of sparkling wine next to you, half your luck, but go for it. Anyway, no matter how you do it, try to commit to memory what you were sensing. I'll give you 10 seconds and then I'll wake you up. <clears throat> okay, wake up. <laughs> um, look, I'll ask you about what, uh, what you've committed to memory a little later. Uh, um, Look, so the perception of dissolved carbon dioxide in still wines is important for quality, for quality reasons. It's worth taking a little time to understand how we perceive the sensation, because um, it will help, help to code the effects of uh, dissolved carbon dioxide on wine that I'll describe later. Um, look, uh, humans have a multiple sensory system that responds to carbon dioxide. When when carbon dioxide is saturated uh, at atmospheric pressure, as is in the case of beer and sparkling wine, it is thought that tasting the results in the release of uh, carbon dioxide bubbles in the mouth, which activate mechanoreceptors, um, in, and which, which we perceive as a sort of foaming sensation. Still wines, on the other hand, contain subsaturated levels. So its perception necessarily relies on other mechanisms. The perception of carbon dioxide in still wines takes two forms. One re relates to that sour acid taste and the other relates to perception of irritation. It's now known that in the presence of carbon dioxide, um, extracellular enzymes known as ca carbonic anhydrases um, that actually are on re receptor cells responsive to acids, and that's important to acids. Um, produce protons and which then are the stimulus for detecting carbonation. Although uh, carbon dioxide activates acid sensing cells, it doesn't, you, it doesn't actually taste sour like say, say like tartaric acid does. And the question is why? Well, one reason is, is that carbon dioxide acts not only on the taste system, but also on, on, um, on the mouth. It stimulates uh, 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 receptors, which are um, in, in, embedded in the, in the surface of your mouth, which are tuned to respond to carbon dioxide. These receptors also respond to weak acids and through slightly different pathways, they also convey information about a broad range of things that we we see in wine, such as astringency, alcohol warmth, and even oral temperature. 
Now, think back to the thought experiment I asked you to do. Um, I'm sure some of you would have thought, ah, dissolved carbon dioxide, when I think of sparkling water, tastes a little bit acidic, but it's not sort of acidic, but it's not classic acidity. Um, but I think you'd all agree that it is a unique feeling. There's nothing quite like it. And the reason is because it's due to the fact that the perception of, of carbonation is a combination of multi-sensory inputs, not only taste, but also feel. Um, and uh, as I said, I, I can't think of any other uh, thing that we taste that has that, uh, has that effect. A um, couple of things on the slide here. It's often described as tingling, prickling, fizzy, and spritzy. And I use the word spritz a lot. Um, and uh, so I'll use that throughout the, uh, the uh, presentation. It has a detection threshold of 0.26 grams per litre. That's, um, and uh, that's the only reference I could find to that. Um, and so we'll now move on. So the research questions we have is how does dissolved carbon dioxide affect the taste, flavour and textural properties of still wine? Does it interact with other important elements of the wine matrix to influence their taste and texture? And finally, um, what are the dynamics of carbon dioxide loss during the serving and consumption of still wine? And does it matter? So we <clears throat> designed an experiment to explore that. Um, I'll run you through it. We used four wines, two whites, two reds, Chardonnay Viognier, Cabernet and Shiraz. These were commercial wines. Um, Good quality but commercial um, and we modified their dissolved carbon dioxide levels by um, creating a carbonated version using a soda stream or um, and we then we also stripped the uh, co2 from the wine by sparging extensively with nitrogen so we had a carbonated highly carbonated and a highly stripped version and then we made, we made blends of those. So to produce different levels of carbon dioxide. Um, we also did that with red wines. Um, then what we did was we, to some of those we added, so we wanted to look at the effect of, eth in the case of white wines, to look at the, the effect of ethanol and also pH. So we added, um, uh, one of the treat experimental treatments was to add 1% ethanol and then we adjusted the wines to 3.2 or 3.4 using Tartaric. In the case of red wines, which is a different experiment, um, we sparged, well, we produced different levels of uh, dissolved carbon dioxide. Um, we then had one of the experimental conditions was the same as the whites with 1% ethanol, but, all, but with the reds, we added some tannin um, to look at the effect um, of, of and the interaction of carbon dioxide with tannin um, at 200 mg per litre, it was an enotannin. One of the important things um, is that with the white wines, and it's really crucial to understanding the results, is that we adjusted for pH after we did the um, uh, carbonate, uh, adjusted the carbonation. Um, and, but with the red wines, there was no pH uh, treatment, so we didn't do that. Ah. Now, this was the elephant in the room. Um, we've, we've probably all seen this. Um, this is um, uh, someone just pouring a glass of wine. And as you can see, um, it's a typical pour of 150 mils into a restaurant style glass. Just pour away, I said, and we took some photos. Um, clearly, there's a lot of agitation resulting in gas release and mixing, um, which with an, experimental, uh, with an experiment like ours, we had to take this into consideration. So what we, um, therefore, what, what we felt was that the amount of dissolved carbon dioxide in the bottle 
may not, may not adequately reflect the carbon dioxide content of the wine that was being tasted and assessed by tasters. So we adopted, a, we adapted a well-known carbon dioxide measuring device called an orbisphere. And there's a picture of it there. Um, it, uh, which is normally used to quantify the amount of carbon dioxide in unopened bottles. And on the left-hand side, you'll see a, a setup. Um, the orbisphere has a very large and sharp needle that punches through either the cork or, or the, or the uh, uh, capsule and um, an in, in, inert gas then pushes that out um, and it's met, it's, the carbon dioxide is measured um, by way of its ele um, electrical conductance. Um, we modified that for glass measurement and on the right hand side you can see Alex there um, with uh, um, measuring the amount of carbon dioxide from a glass. Um, it um, effectively it's a, a seal on the top and it works in the same way as it does in the bottle. Um, by the way, Alex normally doesn't dress like that in the lab. He's, uh, he was in a cool room, so we'll forgive him for, for, for looking like Father Christmas there. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so we were actually right in terms of the effect of pouring. We did a prelim trial where we took four commercial Australian white wines. We just bought them from the shop. Um, we chilled them and then we measured, we measured their dissolved carbon dioxide in the bottle, which is over, whoops, over here. It's at five degrees. We really chilled these down. Then we uh, op opened up the bottle and poured them and we measured them in the glass, which is at the seven. Interestingly enough, they increased by two degrees just by pouring and uh, after about 30 seconds. And you can see there's a substantial drop in all the wines just by pouring. Uh, it's, and from there onwards, we then measured the amount of dissolved carbon dioxide in the glass over a period of time um, that someone would taste. Now, um, my wife would normally taste about here and I would finish the glass myself about the 30 minute mark. <clears throat> so we wanted to um, encapsulate the whole spectrum of how people taste. Um, there's a lot of grinning around the room here. <clears throat> um, so, <clears throat> pardon me. So pouring does have a substantial effect on the uh, level of carbon dioxide, dissolved carbon dioxide, and so does leaving the wine just sitting there. And so we designed an experiment, a uh, sensory evaluation trial that uh, took that into account. First of all, we did 550 mil pours, so we wanted to, keep, wanted to keep it as realistic as possible. We used uh, restaurant style glasses um, and we served the white wines at um, 10 to 11 and a half degrees That's, and the white and the reds at room temperature. That's really important because the effect of carbon dioxide on wine sensory characters is dependent on temperature. And I think you can check that out for yourself. If you get a red wine that you think the carbon dioxide level is right when you taste it and you're tasting it at room temperature, put it in the fridge for a while, let it cool down to 16 and then retaste it. And the carbon dioxide will, will feel totally out of whack. So, um, that's, so we needed to make sure that the serving temperature was right. Um, the, because the amount of carbon dioxide in, or dissolved carbon dioxide reduces over time, we asked the tasters to immediately evaluate them. We gave them two at a time. Um, and to be sure, we, we simultaneously measured the carbon dioxide in the glasses. And you see here with... Um, at the same time as the tasters would, and in the same place where the tasters were actually tasting them. Alex was just on the other side of that wall. Um, we used eight or nine trained tasters, and we did a, a typical descriptive analysis where the, the tasters were trained, they were given some practice sessions, and then they rated the intensity of a series of attributes um, on um, 
to assess the effect of carbon dioxide. The attributes that were chosen were overall aroma and flavour, sweet, sweetness, acidity, bitterness, astringency, viscosity, hotness, and of course, spritz. Um, now, what we found was, uh, I should explain this. This is, um, as I said, we measured the dissolved CO2 in the glass and we knew pouring would have an effect and had a bigger effect than we thought. This is the distribution of the dissolved CO2 um, at varying levels. Uh, so, but, and there's for the on year, I won't show you the reds, but it's similar, but the, uh, they're a little bit tighter. But it, it just showed us that the effect of, you, you have to incorporate the, the pouring and, and standing in, 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 in your interpretation. On the bottom there, uh, the table there shows the average concentrations of dissolved carbon dioxide. So basically this line here. Um, look, uh, if you look at it, I'm sure you'll see down the bottom here, 2.5 and 2.8. Um, and they are very high uh, um, in white wine terms. In fact, they're sort of pushing the level of solubility um, at, at cold temperatures. But we wanted to do that um, to, 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 to be able to assess the top end effects of carbon dioxide. So it's not sort of commercially relevant, but it's, uh, it's, it's certainly uh, worthwhile knowing what effects this high end would have. The red wines were far more um, in terms of what we achieved was were uh, in line with sort of commercial practice for red wines. Um, look, uh, the results, there's, there are a lot of them. Um, the, the data on interactions is too de detailed to provide here. And you can refer to the published paper, which uh, um, the reference is given in the, in the if you log on to the web webinar, I'd um, our site to get this webinar, um, if you're interested. But in short, what we found, and this is important, there were no consistent significant sensory interactions between carbon dioxide and pH and alcohol in the case of whites, or between dissolved carbon dioxide and alcohol and tannin in the case of reds. There was some evidence for a few interactions, but none were consistently observed across all the, all the wines. But I can show you the main effects um, of the effects of carbon dioxide. Um, these are either statistically significant and or show the same trend across all the wines. So there's a pattern there, and I think it's worthwhile um, showing them to you. So let's start with spritz. Um, just a little bit about, um, I, there's got a few of these diagrams, so it's, Pretty easy to understand. Here's the uh, carbon dioxide level here. The orange represents the Chardonnay, green, Viognier, and so on with the Shiraz and Cabernet. Um, this is the intensity of spritz here um, on the side. Now, the first thing um, about spritz is it's very robust. If you look at the, it goes from uh, less than half a unit right up to four. Um, which doesn't sound like a lot, but in the scale we use, century scale we use for this study, that's a really big, really big jump. Um, same with the Viognier, um, and uh, less so for the reds, but you have to remember the dissolved carbon dioxide levels were a bit, a bit lower, so that's understandable. Um, but... Uh, there's a very, very strong dose response pattern here. Um, and this is from a panel that's had very little limited experience with spritz. They've worked with a little bit, but not a lot. But it's something that just hit them in the face, if you like, and they understood it straight away. Um, again, it's, I think because spritz is a really unique um, and different character, it's easy to understand. Um, and uh, so I think that's show, it's been showed here. Okay, overall fruit flavour. I put this one in. Um, this is actually not that significant. Uh, if you have a look, the, this low point here, that's the only one that's low. There and there. 
This is the sparged wine, 100% sparged. Now, sparging strips out flavour. Um, with the non-sparged versions, these here didn't have any sparging at all because they were the control wine, i.e. the wine in the bottle, and the one that we had added a bit of carbonated stuff to. Um, they're all pretty flat. So although it looks like there's a difference here, it's probably just due to sparging. Everything else that wasn't sparged or had any form of sparging applied to it was the same. The, the same thing happened oops, with, um, to go back up, sorry. Same thing happened with aroma. Um, it was a very flat line. So this shows that this, the idea that um, somehow uh, uh, aroma and flavour are increased by carbon dioxide due to stripping and distribution of the volatiles. Um, it's, very, it's very speculative, but we didn't see that here. Um, okay, we'll now go on to sweetness. Now these wines all had a little bit of residual sugar in them. The whites had three, about three to four grams. You know, that's really pretty dry for white wines, but they had perceptible levels. The reds had about one gram per litre. Um, and if you look at the pattern here, some of these are significant statistically. Some of them aren't, but the pattern's the same. There is an increase, general increase in sweetness when carbonation was increased. Now this is an, um, probably doesn't fit in line with um, probably anecdotal things you've seen. Um, and I, uh, and we're working through on, on why that's the case, but I think it can be explained probably with the next slide. Here we go. This is bitterness. Now carbon dioxide had a, a, a negative impact on bitterness. You can see here, here, and look, some of these are a little bit flat, but generally there's a slightly, uh, there's a decrease. Um, now, what's important here is that um, um, bitter compounds always suppress sweet compounds, always, and vice versa. It's a mutual hate relationship between the two. Um, and so, if one goes up it, or one goes down, it will release the other one from suppression and it will go up. So it, and this is the sort of thing that's happening here. We've got bitterness going down. So the sweetness was going up or vice versa. Um, recent work has um, shown that, um, that carbonation produces an overall decrease in the neural processing of sweetness um, someone's actually gone and measured brain uh, activity um, in, the, in the presence of carb, uh, carbonation and sweetness and found that carbonation suppresses it. So it's more likely that it's the result of bitterness going down causing sweetness to go up and not the other way around. Why bitterness went down is another matter, um, but it did. Um, we're not sure why. Now, stringency, this one's hard to fathom. Um, the astringency of the white wines is almost certainly due to their acidity, specifically driven by, which is driven by their pH. Because these are commercial wines, so they don't really have a lot of phenolics or tannin in them. That would have been found out during the winemaking process. Um, indeed, they probably have no tannin at all in them. Um, but so astringency here is probably acid driven. Astringency in the reds, on the other hand, these were full body dry reds. They were clearly astringent. Um, and so these, the astringency from, from the red wines was, is certainly dr driven by tannins. But dissolved carbon dioxide seems to work on them in a similar way. And um, look, it's perhaps it's an, the obvious spritz character sort of was more of a distraction, a cognitive distraction. It's a bit of a long shot that, but um, the cause of it, the effect requires, certainly requires further study. It seems to affect it in the same way. Um, now, I should also mention that, but the, 
the intriguing thing is the white wines, the pH was adjusted after carbonation. So they were the same pH. So um, all of these were the same pH and all of those were the same pH and, but they still went down. So that's something that, you know, I've got to admit has got me stumped a little bit, but we'll, we'll work on that. Now it's worth mentioning the sensory attributes that dissolved carbon dioxide did not affect. Now I don't have slides for those because they're sort of uh, flat lining. I've already talked about aroma and flavor intensity. Now we've got acidity. That's again, an important thing. In the white wines, again, they were pH adjusted after CO2 modification. So that wasn't unexpected. However, in the red wines that weren't pH adjusted, we still didn't have much of an effect on acidity. We've analyzed the wines for pH following modification to dissolve carbon dioxide and found, or well, quite a few wines actually, and it takes a significant amount of dissolved carbon dioxide to budge pH. Um, one of the reasons is that at wine pH, dissolved carbon dioxide is almost all in the form of free CO2 rather than carbonic acid, um, which may explain that. In the case of sparkling water, it's opposite. The pH is neutral, obviously, and we have um, bicarbonate ions and the protons in there, um, which drives down pH and makes, it seem, makes them seem a little bit acidic in taste. Lastly, perceived viscosity and alcohol hotness were not affected by dissolved carbon dioxide. Um, now, I'm going, to, I'm going to put this up, but I'm not going to talk about it in any detail, and it's just mainly for if you um, download this webinar. Um, this is the results of what other people have found. Um, if you look on this uh, column here, it shows that nearly all of the studies, well, actually all of them, are sparkling or semi-sparkling levels. Five grams per litre is probably semi-sparkling, but all these others are mainly research on sparkling water and carbonated soft drinks, etc., and they're all higher. Ours is the only study that is actually at subsaturated levels. The media are also mainly in water, um, and there's a couple of exceptions. These one a French researcher with a model, a model apple cider um, and Clark here with model beer. What's interesting to note is that how different the results are. Um, down, the down arrow means that carbon dioxide suppressed the intensity, up obviously means it increased it. The flat arrow means that it's near mare, it didn't do one or the other. There's a few comments here on the right hand side and this is really quite common. Often it affects things that are, when they're at a, at a low concentration, but affects them differently when they're at a high concentration. Um, but anyway, that's something uh, you can um, bring up at your next party. <clears throat> so, <laughs> and finally, um, this is the recent work we did, um, hot off the press. Does the wine matrix affect the loss of carbon dioxide in glass? Well, what we did here was we got one uh, commercial Chardonnay and we added um, two grams of hot, uh, tartaric acid to one. We boosted one with fortified it with 2% ethanol. And then another one we had the same, this is all the same wine by the way, but we just, these are the, the experimental treatments. We added five grams of fructose and then we measured the um, uh, loss in the glass. You'll see again, this is pouring. This is the beginning in the glass. We decided to cut it off after 15 minutes because let's face it, if you're a winemaker and someone hasn't tasted your wine after 30 minutes, carbon dioxide is the least of your problems. So um, that's where we cut it off. Um, what we started, what we found was that the uh, 2% ethanol resulted in a, a slightly larger reduction than, than the others. Over here, this figure here shows, this is the slope of the lines. These are all linear, by the way, very strongly linear. The, the dot indicates the slope. Obviously, the more negative the slope, the steeper the decline. And so this shows that ethanol 
is causing a decline, but practically it's not a very large decline, but it is, it is significant in a statistical sense. The last thing we did was we thought, what, what's the effect of someone pouring a wine, swirling it, sipping it, putting it back down? And so we set up a, an experiment where we, we just looked at that. It was a fun experiment. Um, and it was a bit surprising. We thought that that would actually cause a very large decline in dissolved carbon dioxide. It did a little bit and it was again significant. Oops, sorry about that. It was significant, but again, if you looked at if you look at it from a practical point of view, um, it didn't actually vary that much, even when you swelled it, picked it up, and put it down, um, and that was done every five minutes. Um, and so, <clears throat> um, that was a bit of a surprising outcome. Um, if you look at the previous figure, the decrease and that figure, they generally go down from around about. Um, uh, from the time that they're poured from around about 0.9 to around about 0.8 in this figure here, again, 0.95 to 0.8. So the decline was relatively small. Um, if, if you go back and have a look at the, the results of the other trial, it would suggest that this decline in dissolved carbon dioxide um, wouldn't have a really big impact on the taste and, and textures of, of, of wine, despite the, despite the decline. Um, so in summary, higher concentrations of dissolved carbon dioxide consistently resulted in heightened sweetness, lower bitterness, which I should say were, are, are probably related, and reduced astringency didn't have a consistent effect on uh, overall aroma, flavour, viscosity or hotness. Although some of the other, um, uh, uh, that review I showed you a few slides back would indicate the viscosity and hotness haven't been studied very much, but there have been, a, others have found differences there. Um, the, the hypothesised interactions between dissolved carbon dioxide and other wine components, ones like sharing the same receptors, um, were not consistently observed. So they, there's some independence there between carbon dioxide and the other, the other mouthfeel characteristics. And the in-glass losses of carbon dioxide during pouring consumption were, were found, but were not likely to be, have a significant effect on the taste or mouthfeel over the time course of a typical consumption event. Um, so, rest, so you can sit on your glasses of wine if you like, um, and it won't affect them that much. All right, thank you for, um, for listening. And uh, as always, I'd like to uh, acknowledge our, our Australia, Wine Australia for funding this work, um, and uh, also the Australian government who provides matching funds. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Thanks very much for your presentation there, Richard. Um, very comprehensive. Um, we're going to roll from here straight into a Q&A. So if you've got any questions regarding um, this, um, these trials, then please start sending them through. We have also got uh, Richard's colleague, Alex Shulkin, in the room, who um, was involved in these trials, and he's also available to um, answer any of those questions. Um, just a reminder, if you're not familiar, open up the Q&A button, um, type your question in and send it through. Uh, we've had a couple of questions come through already, Richard and Alex. Uh, the first one was, what was the ethanol adjusted up to in that last trial? Um, you're muted. Okay, thanks for the questions. Um, if the last trial uh, was 2% ethanol yep. added, um, the wine was uh, around about 14%. It was an Australian Chardonnay. So um, it was, yeah, the original wine was 14, thereabouts, and 2% uh, was added. 
Okay. Bit of a follow up to that one, Richard. What is the relationship between the ethanol and dissolved CO2? How do they interact? Um, okay. Um, a CO2 is less soluble in ethanol. So um, that would explain why um, when the wine was sitting in the glass and over a period of time, because it's, uh, cause it's less soluble. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. It's more soluble. So that would have mean the, the uh, CO2 would be more easily released. Okay, thank you. Um, do you have any comments around the size of the bead and how that may influence the perception of sweetness and creaminess? Um, actually, this isn't, uh, this is not my gig. Um, uh, we, we don't work with sparkling wine. So in the case of still wines, there's no bead. There's actually no bubbles involved, um, which is, uh, uh, obviously a huge difference. So unfortunately I can't comment on that one. No problem. Um, Question here about how soon should the wine be poured for a tasting panel before it's actually tasted? So more a general question around. Oh, um, I, I guess it depends on what you're actually, um, what you're assessing because, for example, if you're assessing aroma and flavour, we've shown that the CO2 doesn't really affect it that much. So it doesn't really matter that. Um, um, so, um, but when it comes to things like sweetness um, and bitterness, etc., cetera, it would, uh, you'd have to do it more, more rapidly. And we did it within about, um, the tasters got two, two wines and they tasted them within about five minutes. And there was still, there was still some variation there. Okay, thank you. I uh, might shoot this one over to you, Alex. Um, how did you measure bitterness versus astringency? Uh, we, we, uh, it was a sensory assessment. So uh, we just relied on the uh, tester's score. We didn't directly measure those compounds. Okay. Yep. Great. And we've also got a question here about um, some so-called natural wines have ele elevated levels of CO2. Would you expect similar results if you ran this study on those types of wines? Uh, generally speaking, I don't see why not. Um, elevated levels of CO2 in natural wines can be just a result of less manipulation. Filtration uh, does remove fair bit of uh, CO2 from wines, natural wines are generally less filtered. Um, you would certainly, uh, but the effects I would expect would be similar unless there are other factors involved that we haven't assessed. It's worth noting that Alex here is an experienced natural winemaker. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> Indeed, if anyone would know, Alex would. Yeah. Okay. Um, Richard, do you know if there's any long-term trials on how dissolved um, carbon dioxide levels affects red wine aging in bottle? Um, not that I know of. Um, uh, certainly not in Australia. <laughs> uh, there's the aged red wines is a relatively small market here. So it's it probably is around the world. Um, so I, I, I don't know of any. Okay, um, no problem. Has there been any work on the typical CO2 losses in the bottling process? Um, ooh, that's a very practical <laughs> winery type question. Um, I don't know, do you know any Alex? Um, unaware. No, I'm not sure. Um, we could certainly find out for you. Um, we have a um, full-time analogist on staff, and if you'd like to leave, if you 
your details, we can we can chase that up. Yeah, absolutely. For any questions that that we can't answer here, we'll we might shoot through to the to the AWRI help desk to see if they've got any answers. Generally, my guess would be that it would highly depend on the actual bottling process and the aim. So, if a winemaker wants to minimise those losses, that there are ways to obviously minimise disturbance and spodging and things like that, or uh, the other way around. Okay. Um, general question about how wine shows should approach these findings uh, when pouring out of a current vintage of Riesling or Semyon, do they pour immediately before tasting or is, would you suggest something else? Well, I think pouring immediately before tasting is always a good idea. Um, it, I mean, we found that the CO2 level does drop you know, perhaps with really experienced wine judges that they would see um, an effect of that. Um, we saw a small effect with uh, less experienced people. Uh, so probably yes, but I can't really see um, being involved in a few few wine shows in the past that uh, the huge undertaking. So it's been fairly hard to achieve. Okay, look, I think we might leave it there, Richard and Alex. Um, before we start to wrap up though, do you have any final comments or anything you want to leave the audience with? No, they're both shaking their heads. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think we might leave it there. Um, first, like to um, throw out a big thank you to Richard for uh, coming in and presenting um, findings on these these trials. Also, thank you to Alex for making himself available for this webinar and to answer any of your questions. Um, Richard, do you wanna just skip through to the final slide there? There's one extra slide there. Um, I'd also like to thank the, the audience for participating in today's session. Um, for attendees, you'll receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording. Um, and also just like to remind you about the next AWRI webinar, which is on Thursday, the 16th of July. Um, this is a cover cropping um, session, underbind cover cropping. And um, yeah, if you haven't registered for this session and you would like to do so, please visit the AWRI website. Uh, thank you again. And I look forward to seeing you at the next session.